Okay, but then I will start with a short introduction and then I guess if there are someone who is a little bit late then they can join. Uh, first then I wish to uh, wish you all very welcome to this MSc, MMB and Hiram Twai Zoom seminar. And then of course a very special welcome to you, Harry. Uh, and it's very nice to see so many participants. <clears throat> Last I looked, it was 63. Uh, even if it's, of course, a pity that it is on Zoom, and even if that is the future. Uh, because this was planned to take place at the Here I Am To I workshop. And you can see behind me here, it's a photo from last workshop, which was, the weather was, as usual, very nice. And it should also have been at MSE, which was planned. Uh, but I hope that we will have a new opportunity uh, next uh, spring. And before introducing today's eminent speaker, I would like to suggest that all mute uh, and that the questions are saved to the end because it would be difficult to, to handle during the, the talk, I think. So, and you can also write your uh, questions in the chat and then you can also mark uh, by raise hand which you find in the, in the participant list in the bottom of that. Uh, because then it can be easier to, to direct the questions in the end. Uh, and then I will also like to say that this uh, seminar is being recorded. So by that then to today's speaker, and it is really an honor for me to present Professor Sir Harry Badisha. Uh, which research area is in the theory of solid state transformation in metals, particularly multi-component steels. And he has published more than 700 uh, papers and several books. He, he has a number of awards and honorary titles, and I will only mention a few. For example, he was awarded the Bessemer Gold Medal in 2006 and the Adolf Martens Medal in 2017. Uh, in 2008, he was appointed the first part of the Professor of Metallurgy at the University of Cambridge, uh, where he was active. He is a fellow of the Royal Society and Royal Academy of Alert, in UK. Excuse me. And now it's someone who was not perhaps muted. Uh, uh, he has established the SKF University Technology Center and he has been active at Postdoc post post in Korea, creating the Graduate Institute of Ferrous, for Ferrous Technology. And in 2000, he was appointed Knight Bachelor. And uh, today we will have the opportunity to hear about when strong steels becomes tired. Please. Thank you very much, uh, Annika, and I'm very grateful to, for this opportunity to make a presentation. Uh, and I've spent quite a lot of time, time uh, putting together a story connecting the different kinds of fatigue phenomena that are important in very strong steels. So in this image, you can see a, a shaft here with the classic uh, fracture surface that you expect with uh, fatigue of smooth objects. Uh, you see here a rail which has obviously got some damage. This is a, a ball from a ball bearing and this is a rather small bearing actually even though it's quite heavy. Uh, you now get windmill uh, wind turbine bearings which are four meters in size and I will talk a little bit about that as well. All of these have different kinds of fatigue because the loadings on the components are also quite different and extremely complex in some cases. So I'll go, go into that in a little bit more detail later. But in the process of putting together this presentation, I also did some historical research. And I found that the very first paper that I could discover uh, on fatigue was 1954 from the Institution of Civil Engineers in London. The title of the paper was on the fatigue and consequent fracture of metals. Now, the important thing about this is that in the old days, 
when you publish something, there was really nice discussion. So there's a footnote here. Oops, sorry. Uh, there's a footnote which says, the discussion of this paper extended over portions of two evenings. Now, think about your own paper. Have you ever had discussion extending over two evenings? I would love for this kind of discussion to happen with each paper that we publish. Uh, the paper also says that the term fatigue was actually suggested by Mr. Field. Now, I have no idea who Mr. Field is because it didn't go into any detail, but maybe this is the first time uh, that the term fatigue was used. So the original paper was in 1854, and in 1902, uh, these might be the first metallographic observations to show that even though you are repeatedly loading the material at a stress which is well below the macroscopic yield stress of the material, there are microscopic phenomena which happen afterwards. So this is before any stress reversals or very few stress reversals. This is after 40,000 stress reversals. So you get these features developing, which are signs of microscopic plasticity happening presumably at some sort of stress concentrations or where compatibility between grains is failing. So fatigue happens at stresses which are below the macroscopic yield stress, but that doesn't mean that there isn't plasticity going on. And this was published in 1902, and it happens to be from the University of Cambridge. Uh, then you have the classic uh, work of Walder, where he designed these experiments to uh, measure fatigue strength uh, in a rotating bending uh, sample. And actually his definition uh, of fatigue is very precise. And I'm looking at an 1876 translation into English of his work, uh, where he says, you know, it's the rupture of material which may be caused by repeated vibrations, none of which attain the absolute breaking limit. Uh, so what I said earlier was that, you know, the macroscopic yield strength may be much greater than the strength at which this uh, fails by fatigue. And that is why fatigue uh, tends to be a very dangerous phenomenon in many circumstances. And I heard somewhere, I have no evidence, I heard that something like over 90% of failures of uh, materials, metallic materials, is due to fatigue. Um, so it is perhaps the most important failure mechanism. And one difficulty is that you have to assign a life to components, all right? So you do a lot of fatigue testing and you work out the probability of failure. And in, in the context of bearings, you know, you have the L90 life or L10 life, where, you know, you expect 10% of the bearings to fail after a particular time period. So the ability to predict failure is extremely important because it determines the life of complicated engineering components. Right, so I'm going to start with shafts and uh, explain, uh, that, explain the kinds of loadings that they get, the damage mechanisms, and how we can estimate life. Now the picture at the bottom is, uh, is of aero engine shafts, civil aero engine shafts. Uh, they are the blanks uh, they, they will be machined afterwards. But this is a new alloy that uh, we have designed uh, for a civil engine shaft, which is based on um, intermetallic compounds inside steel, because these shafts can reach transient temperatures greater than 400 degrees centigrade. But at the same time, they have uh, obvious fatigue loading because they are quite long, and therefore you will have surface stresses due to bending, and there will be a second set of um, uh, loading imposed when you have takeoff and landing, which is uh, more severe. So it isn't a single kind of loading, but a very complex kind of loading. There will also be noise due to turbulence uh, in the aircraft and so forth. And the features that are machined onto the shaft so that it connects to all the other rotating features in the aero engine are actually quite complicated. And 
you can see that there would be obvious stress concentrations and so forth. And a failure of a shaft like this would be a major uh, difficulty uh, in a flying aircraft. So how do we deal with something like this in terms of uh, estimating life and damage mechanisms and so forth? Now for smooth objects, it's quite well established that you need to make your material extremely clean, right? Because, you know, initiation of fatigue begins at stress concentrations, which may come from uh, inclusions present in the material or even uh, particles that you add in order to strengthen the material. So you do certain kinds of tests when you want to estimate the behavior of a shaft. And one of these is a push-pull test. And a push-pull test involves uh, a large volume of material being subjected to cyclic stresses. And the reason for doing it like this rather than in a rotating bending operation is because there's a higher probability of picking up defects if you stress a larger volume of material. So that, if you like, is a, a, is a kind of a quality control test to assess whether you have particles beyond a certain size which are going to initiate fatigue. Okay, so no matter how clean you make your steel by vacuum arc refining and, and so forth, there will be particles inside there which will initiate fatigue. And in many cases, uh, the initiation is from the surface of the shaft, uh, in which case a rotating bending type test is perfectly okay. And normally, uh, the normal way to test is by using a regular stress profile, a periodic regular stress profile. Now, um, it was known a very long time ago that there is a limit beyond which uh, fatigue doesn't uh, operate in steels, in iron alloys. So this is a, a statement from 90, uh, 1876, uh, which says these experiments prove that there is a limit of strain within which iron is practically indestructible. Now that's a very, uh, very powerful statement to make. I'm sure it's not practically indestructible, but what he's trying to explain is that there is a fatigue limit. That means a stress amplitude below which we don't see fatigue failure for a very long time. And if you consider a very long time to be 10 million cycles, uh, you might actually get failure after 10 to the nine cycles. So sometimes this is called an endurance limit. That means you define you know, what you think is a very long time period and then uh, design the component life in that context. Now shafts are very easy objects in one sense. It, it, you know, when I compare with what happens in bearings and in uh, uh, rails, uh, they are smooth objects, clean steel, and uh, very specific functions. And it's well known that the fatigue limit correlates strongly with the hardness of the material. So here, for example, it's a very large data set on a large variety of steels, where basically, you know, you make your material harder then the fatigue limit increases. And uh, this is a, a particular uh, rotating bending test and fatigue limit determination that we did on the nanostructured bainite. And you can see that it more or less follows the trends. So you could argue that this kind of fatigue, which starts from a clean, smooth object is fairly predictable and depends very much more on engineering parameters rather than on the structure of the steel. And I'll illustrate what I mean by this uh, uh, shortly. But before I do that, sometimes the fatigue limit is so low that you cannot use it practically. Okay? You have to load beyond the fatigue limit and then calculate a life. Uh, so you will get a fatigue crack and that fatigue crack will then propagate and eventually it will reach a critical size where the fracture toughness tells you that you're going to get uncontrolled failure. So the classic way of treating uh, that problem 
is to look at the crack growth rate. Uh, so once a crack is initiated, it will propagate. And you know, the equation at the top is the Paris law regime, where once a crack has nucleated, it grows on a log-log plot at a constant, uh, a constant rate with the number of cycles. And delta K is your stress intensity range uh, to which the crack tip is subjected. And M has a meaning. It's, it's the Paris exponent, and it depends uh, what mechanism is operating during fatigue. So eventually that crack will grow um, by fatigue. But when it reaches a critical size, uh, you will get fast fracture. And that means that the toughness of your material comes into play. So this is uncontrolled fast fracture after uh, a short amount of fatigue crack propagation in a very, very strong steel. So we need to actually understand fatigue crack propagation in terms of uh, engineering parameters. Uh, the threshold stress, that means the threshold uh, stress intensity range is the bit which is sensitive to microstructure. That means the initiation of uh, the growth of the fatigue crack. But during steady state propagation, the microstructure, uh, I'm making a bold statement, the microstructure doesn't matter too much, okay? Uh, compared with other phenomena I'm going to talk about. So what we did is these tests are very expensive and you need to do a lot of them in order to get a reasonable understanding of your material. So what we did is we know that there are vast quantities of experimental data available in the literature on fatigue growth, growth rate, even uh, huge compendiums listing, you know, the steel, the heat treatment, uh, parameters such as strength and ductility, toughness, and so on, and measuring fatigue crack growth rate under different circumstances uh, so you can have mode one loading, or you can have shear loading and uh, shear in a different way and so on. So all those data, huge quantities are available in the literature. And you need to actually take advantage of those data. Uh, but it is a very complicated problem. So we go for an empirical method. An empirical method, you know, the so-called artificial intelligence is nothing but an empirical method a nonlinear method for representing complex data with many, many variables, all right? It's a very simple, transparent method. And when we use terms like artificial intelligence, they just make it a bit more sexy, but it's very straightforward mathematics involved. And I'll illustrate that to you. Uh, and also bear in mind that there's nothing wrong in using an empirical method if you use it sensibly. Uh, you know, thermodynamics is completely empirical. So there's nothing to say that we cannot get a temperature below, below zero Kelvin. Uh, and you know, if you think about thermocalc, then it relies completely on empirical data which are measured. So people sometimes are derisory about things like uh, artificial intelligence and so on, but we've been using regression analysis for many, many years. This is a much more, um, much more effective way of doing empirical analysis. So basically it involves creating uh, mathematical functions which are very flexible, okay? So you can see that just by altering some coefficients in this equation at the bottom, I can make this surface sing and dance in many complicated ways. And that means I can capture the real complexity in the data. However, it is so complex, uh, the surface, that it can pass through every single point. And that's not what we want because we don't want to model noise. Uh, so in my two slide introduction to artificial intelligence, this is how you tackle uh, overfitting. And uh, also um, the fact that there are domains inside your input space where you have no data. So in this method, you do not find a best fit set of coefficients but you find a distribution of coefficients and that distribution will be different in different regions of the domain, of your input domain. So you might have a hundred variables. That's what I mean by the domain. Uh, so you're not fitting one function, but you're fitting a very large number of functions which will 
replicate the data in the regions which you know, and then we'll extrapolate differently. That's the nature of uh, empirical methods. However, the system tells you that, look here, the deviation is very large because we don't have enough knowledge. So you very clearly know the dangers that you're in when using the method, right? So the error bar is not simply a noise, but it's about the uncertainty of modeling in a particular region of space. And really that's the region you're interested in when you're designing new materials. So we did a lot of hard work, collected a huge quantity of data, and uh, the horizontal axis tells you um, the input variables. So we used engineering parameters, uh, elongation, tensile strength, proof strength, and loading mode, you know, whether it's K1C or K2C, etc. Uh, the sample size matters, the frequency, stress intensity range, and the vertical bars uh, simply tell you that after the analysis, you know, this particular variable is important if the bar is large, all right? So no. we've got more than a thousand, thousand sets of data to analyze. And when we did that, uh, uh, I'm only <coughs> showing you the plots where we are comparing against data which were not used in creating the model. So oh. this is the classic uh, Paris uh, plot. They are plotting the crack growth rate on the vertical axis and the stress intensity range on the horizontal axis. And the points come from a steel which was not included inside the database used for creating the model. And you can see that it's pretty good uh, prediction. Uh, it happens to be the case that this is for a bearing steel which was not included in the data set. Now, let me go back one slide. If you look at these input parameters, there's nothing in there to say that this is a steel. They are simply engineering parameters. So we've created this model based completely on steels, but the parameters could be for any material. So can we make predictions for other materials using a model that is created only on steels, right? So I want to show you the power of this method. You know, it's, it's amazingly good in modeling complex mechanical properties, because remember, most people only measure properties. They do not actually predict them. They use the measurements in design, but we are interested in creating new materials and therefore, you know, it's incomplete if we only have a microstructure estimation model, but you can't go on to predict complex properties. And fatigue is a complex property. Okay, so this was steel. Same model applied to nickel alloys. Absolutely amazing, you know. Uh, it predicts the fatigue behavior of nickel alloys with the same input parameters. And here's titanium and aluminum alloys. So I think that you know this method is incredibly useful and we've used it and exploited it since uh, something like 1990 to create models for mechanical properties which do not, uh, which are simply not predictable, okay? So I often use a slide in my lectures which is uh, from Stephen Hawking's uh, movie, The Theory of Everything. And even when he was alive, I would say that, look, if I gave Stephen Hawking all the parameters of the steel, absolutely at all scales, he still would not be able to predict the tensile properties of that steel. So we are really far behind in predicting mechanical properties. And this method is uh, like a panacea because we have a huge quantity of data out there. It's a simple matter, not simple, but uh, very hard work to collect the data, but if you can make use of that, then that effectively gives us a system like Thermocalc. You know, Thermocalc and its uh, colleagues uh, were all created by accumulating thermodynamic data over a period of many decades. Okay, one word of caution, right, is that we were designing uh, welding alloys, all right? So these are alloys which would undergo 
phase transformation during cooling in such a way that they cancel out the development of residual stress in the system. This is work we did with ESA baby in Sweden and uh, with TWI in Cambridge. So it's like transformation plasticity that canceling out thermal contraction in a constrained assembly where you make a joint. And it's very effective in uh, actually converting tensile stresses into compressive stresses. And it has been demonstrated all over the world that that improves fatigue life of the welded joint. What is not clear is that when, for example, you make a complicated weld for earth moving equipment, right, it's not going to be subjected to regular loading. And all the tests on these kinds of uh, welding alloys have been done with regular loading. If you have noisy, um, noisy loading, that means you know your truck is going over a rock and you suddenly get a peak of stress that might actually homogenize the nice compressive residual stresses that you built into the system using transformation induced plasticity. So uh, we did these full scale tests. These are fillet welds here. And um, this is a fatigue failure in that fillet weld. But the weld metal itself is made from a steel which transforms at a temperature of only 200 degrees centigrade. The reason being that if you transform, if your welding material transforms at a high temperature, then it will be exhausted by the time the residual stress uh, builds up. So the transformation has to happen at a low temperature. So we call these low te temperature transforming welding alloys. And they are martensitic, uh, almost zero carbon. So uh, these tests are extremely expensive. So there's only a few data here, but we can show that within the limits of experimental error, uh, the imposition of overloads doesn't actually wipe out the benefits that you get from using this kind of a welding material, which cancels out residual stresses. So I haven't plotted a line here, which is a design line, which comes something like this, okay? So these are all, transformation induced plasticity welding alloys, and they all perform better than the normal welding alloys, uh, but also when we have these overload scenarios. Okay? So um, we need to consider the type of loading that will be experienced in service in order to really claim that we have success. Okay, so that uh, I think is uh, the bit on shafts. Then I go on to bearings, and it's a completely different scenario because uh, a proper bearing would have lubrication such that you develop a hydrodynamic film between the uh, moving components and the stationary component. So it's a completely lubricated system. Uh, now, the sort of loading that you get is completely different from that in a shaft. So this is, uh, this is uh, known as Hertzian loading. So we've got a, uh, a sphere here, uh, which is the ball or rolling element. And we've got a surface and there is a certain amount of elastic contact because in the case of a bearing, the materials are extremely hard and we've got this thin film of lubricant in between. So it's, it truly is elastic loading. And Hertz proved many, many years ago that the maximum shear stress arises actually under the surface, right? Not, uh, not um, uh, at the contact position. Uh, so every time a rolling element goes over a surface, it will induce a pulse of stress under the surface and that accumulates damage and then you get spalling of the surface. And this is approximately the same, a fairly, fairly good approximation as having compression and torsion happening at the same time. Okay. Now, the fact that we have this kind of a stress system means that we can use quite brittle materials 
to make bearings. Now, bearings are incredibly important, but you know, if you think about the toughness of a typical bearing steel, it's awful compared with uh, structural steel. But it's able to uh, survive because of the nature of this stress uh, and other factors such as rolling contact fatigue determine the life rather than things like toughness. So typical hardness of uh, a bearing would be something like 60 Rockwell hardness, which is very, very hard. And uh, the toughness is uh, so low that people report impact uh, tests with U notches instead of V notches. And K1C is basically extremely low. Okay, so let's just think about a, a typical bearing. The contact pressure uh, between the rolling element and the raceway is of the order of two gigapascals. It might be rotating at 2000 RPM and let's assume there are 20 balls. Then there's about 40,000 stress pulses experienced at a point on the raceway, under the raceway, during one minute, 40,000 of these. Now imagine that you're being punched, okay, 40,000 times per minute with a contact pressure of two gigapascals. And yet, you know, bearings serve reliably, okay? So steel is just an amazing material. Now these are typical uh, bearing seals. The, the one at the top really is, covers the vast majority of bearings which operate at uh, ambient temperatures. And then you have the two variants underneath which are designed for aircraft engines. The one in the middle, uh, so the aircraft engine bearings can get up to 80 degrees centigrade typically. Uh, the one in the middle uh, doesn't have uh, toughness, whereas the one at the bottom is a case, harden, a case hardening steel. So you have a tough material, but then you have a, a surface which is hardened to take the uh, contact pressure. Now, you may have heard about this quite often that there is this uh, damage mechanism which creates white matter inside the bearing. Now it's called white matter because when you polish and etch a cross section, uh, some regions will etch very lightly compared with others, and those are the regions where damage is accumulating. So it's a localized region of severely deformed material, under the, usually under the surface of the bearing, because you know the maximum shear stresses are under the surface, and there have been a large number of high resolution studies done on this and effectively uh, you know if i can describe it very simply it's a mechanically mixed region rather like uh, mechanical alloying so whereas before you started the bearing you had these the proyotectoid cementite particles and in a martensite or bainite matrix those cementite particles are being fractured and mixed with the steel so you end up with a region uh, called the white uh, white matter, which is hard and with a very, very fine structure, consistent with what we do in mechanical alloying. So the carbides, uh, the proyotectoid carbides enter into solution and make that region harder relative to its surroundings. And the density of defects in that region is so large that it etches uniformly compared with the background where the spacing of defects is much larger. So it is very easily identified and therefore it's very easy to blame everything on this white matter. And here, here is an image of that. So this is a crack that has developed in a bearing and you can see these white etching regions here. Uh, of course, this is a two-dimensional section. It, is, it has a more complicated shape than illustrated here. Uh, but this is a telling statement that was made uh, by people working on wind turbine bearings, that either the crack propagates around these areas or that the cracks start from the white etching areas. But we are not sure. 
And this is the chicken and egg situation which has faced the bearing industry for quite a long time. That is the white matter causing the damage or is the crack simply deviating through those white regions? Uh, so the propagating, uh, note also that the propagating crack is not uniformly covering. Uh, you know, we don't have white matter all along this. These vertical sections don't have the white matter. And that gives us a clue that supposing you have a pre-existing crack, which is oriented so that the crack faces beat against each other, then you will effectively create mechanical alloying. But if the crack faces are vertically, then they're not beating against each other. And maybe that is the cause of uh, white matter formation. So in that scenario, the cracks would come first. If you look at a typical uh, micrograph from a bearing steel, you can see that there are plenty of regions where you might have pre-existing weak interfaces, okay? uh, or, or cracks in other words. So we should assume that we actually have cracks inside the bearing. Nobody will admit to that because nobody wants to say that their bearing has cracks, okay? But if you look hard enough, you will find very small subcritical cracks. Uh, the micrograph at the bottom just shows uh, the structure. Uh, in this case, it is bainitic with uh, cementite particles inside the plates, but it can also be uh, martensite, which is tempered at a very low temperature. And it develops into this uh, beautiful looking, um, the white matter develops into this very beautiful looking region, which is called a butterfly, right? For obvious reasons, there are wings and in the middle was an inclusion or a carbide particle, which is dissolved. And you can see that uh, there are cracks here. Okay, now a question often asked is why, uh, you know, if, if this is, uh, connected with shear stresses, why don't we have rings like this, okay? And of course, the reason is that it's rotating in just one sense. If you reverse the sense of rotation after, afterwards, then you develop rings like this. And there's a picture of that in the review that I wrote in uh, Progress in Material Science on bearing steels. So that's not a, a mystery. And these regions are extremely hard and basically nanostructured. Now, the interesting thing is that the butterflies appear long before failure happens, okay? So you can see that um, on this plot, the butterflies are there at less than 10 to the five cycles uh, and continued development of wire attaching material goes on until 50% of the bearings in your sample have, say, uh, have failed. And that is normal. So when you take a bearing out of service which hasn't failed, you'll be able to find many of, the, of these regions. So just to summarize, they, you know, they, they result from repeated localized deformation and they become hard because the carbides are being forced into solution by mechanical alloying and there are many uh, many previous works on cementite being forced into solution by severe deformation, for example, in the drawing of politic wires and various other things. And uh, hydrogen uh, stimulates white matter. So if you charge your material with hydrogen beforehand, then you get lots more of white matter. Of course, that isn't a mystery at all, uh, as you will see later. Uh, why does hydrogen do that? So. The questions are why is the deformation localized? Is it a symptom of damage or is it the cause of damage? And what is the role of hydrogen? And one thing I would say is it is a complete waste of time to do a test with the material charged with hydrogen. Not because it is completely unrepresentative of the real infusion of hydrogen into the material, but because we know that hydrogen already damages the steel. Okay, so I, the original paper on hydrogen embrittlement was from 1873 and contains 90% of everything you would want to know about hydrogen embrittlement. Um, hydrogen embrittles, we know that there's no point in doing tests, uh, tests on that. 
Now, the interesting thing is that these are high carbon steels, about one weight percent carbon. And uh, we did some work many years ago, which showed that if we increase the length of a martensite plate by increasing the austenite grain size, then the plates will crack periodically on, on quenching, okay? And George Krauss uh, from Colorado School of Mines has done uh, something uh, on martensite plates cracking. And the, these are kind of periodic cracks. And basically, uh, you know, as you make your martensite finer and finer, it's difficult to transfer stress into a, onto a smaller plate, and therefore it will not crack, even though it has one weight percent carbon. So we designed a method for introducing cracks into bearing steels by using uh, heat treatments which are not normally used. So these are subcritical cracks which have introduced into a bearing steel. Okay, uh, lots and lots of micro cracks and we can include uh, surface cracks. So here, for example, is uh, surface cracks introduced by putting a hardness indent in the middle and polishing away all the damage from the hardness indent itself, apart from the cracking. And then we do rolling contact fatigue tests. And sure enough, you find the white matter developing at the cracks and not in other positions. So it's basically, the beating of the faces of the cracks, which causes the mechanical alloying action and produces the white matter. So what is the answer? Well, we've got to get rid of the cracks. And how do you get rid of cracks? You've got to make the material tougher, okay? Uh, you know, the typical bearing uh, steel 52100 contains proetectoid cementite particles, which are more than one micrometer in size. Uh, for a material that is 60 Rockwell in hardness, that is a crack initiator, okay? So we've got to do something to improve the toughness. And I'm going to show you uh, a steel which is tough and yet has, uh, so when we design a steel, it usually cannot be on the basis of a single property. It's got to be a basket of properties, but I don't have time to mention all of them. So at the moment, I'm focusing on uh, toughness and uh, strength. And I won't go into detail, but you can produce a nanostructured uh, bainitic steel, which is a mixture of extremely fine plates of bainite. You can see the scale here is uh, 200 angstroms. And the plates are actually finer than carbon nanotubes at the same magnification. And what we want to do is to see whether this material, which is much tougher than a normal bearing steel, uh, actually performs better in rolling contact fatigue without the damage mechanisms that we normally get in bearing steels. Uh, and this is the damage mechanism that uh, we are mostly interested in, the formation of uh, this white matter. Okay, so we did the rolling contact uh, fatigue test, and sure enough, we do not see white matter developing around the cracks and the cracks are initiated on inclusions here and we see ductile failure mechanisms during rolling contact fatigue okay so you can see these are microscopic porosity resulting from ductile mechanisms and the cracks even branch considerably because this is a, a much more ductile material than the conventional bearing steel this is uh, showing you the surface region here. Uh, so you can produce something which has better performance by increasing its toughness. Just look at the amount of crack branching we have here and no obvious regions of the white etching material. Um, the cracks actually begin, uh, of course this is a, a high resolution micrograph and you know if you add all the micrographs ever taken in a transmission electron microscope, they amount to less than a pin. So we don't know how representative this is, but the cracks seem to initiate at the interface between the bainitic ferrite and the martensite that results from the phase transformation of the austenite under stress. But nevertheless, uh, you know, this is um, a ductile failure mechanism. 
and in in tests where we controlled against a, a sample which is not tough and tough we can see an improvement in the rolling contact fatigue performance now we tried very very hard to persuade um, SKF to look at this seriously without worrying about detail, all right? But you need, you need industries which are adventurous, okay? And my colleagues in China have produced the bearings, one, one, uh, one meter size bearings. Uh, so this particular ring is too large to make uh, with the facilities they have. Uh, the ones in the background, uh, are nanostructured bainite and the rolling elements inside this large ring are also nanostructured bainite. And they have demonstrated that you get uh, benefit in actual uh, bearing operation. I don't have um, any more details because this is very recent work, but it is published work. Okay, so the thing that we learned from this is that we need to eliminate coarse particles and you know bearing steels are incredibly clean steels um, actually uh, you know Owako when it makes bearing steels they are cleaner than the steels we can make in our laboratory in Cambridge by arc melting all right for starting from pure materials so on a large scale they can make extremely clean steels so in that circumstance it's the particles like cementite protected cementite particles and the reason for proyectoid cementite particles being there mostly is that it's very easy to spheroidize by a process known as a divorced eutectoid, where you already have these proyectoid cementite particles. So when the interface uh, advances, you don't get perlite, but these actually uh, these uh, small particles coarsen and absorb the excess carbon, so you end up with spheroidized cementite very very easily. Okay, without doing prolonged heat treatment. This isn't, uh, although um, these diagrams are from this paper, this process has been known for a very, very long time. So if I go back to this, uh, you have to ask yourself the question, why do we need these carbides? And there isn't actually good evidence uh, that you need them, right? Because 52100, which is the most common bearing steel, actually comes from a tool steel which had a different purpose. So SKF have now looked at steels which do not have this proyectoid ferrite for, for their bearing. So in conclusion, uh, you need to improve toughness. And the only reason why hydrogen matters is because it reduces toughness, okay? And there is no need to do any experiments to show that hydrogen will embrittle and produce more white matter. That should be taken as a known. And we need to eliminate the proyectoid cementite. So you've seen how complicated this is. And actually the story is far more complicated than that because the production of a bearing requires many other parameters to be optimized other than fatigue performance. You know, you've got to be able to manufacture the material and all that is described nicely in the review that I wrote in progress in material science. Okay, moving on to rails. And now the stress system again is completely different. So this is a, a calculation of the shear stress below the surface uh, when you have perfect lubrication. That means it's, it's simply rolling. You can see that the shear stress peaks under the surface, okay? But as soon as you, in, uh, rails are not lubricated. You know, you've got metal against metal. So, uh, and there is a, a significant amount of sliding involved. So when you take account of the sliding, the maximum stresses uh, move towards the surface. Uh, and therefore, you've got to look at surface initiation as well. And this is the sort of damage that you get uh, on a rail because of fatigue failure. And that damage can lead to catastrophic failure. So what they do usually is uh, to grind that off periodically, okay? So you, you have a train going over the rails, which has grinding equipment, which removes the defect of, at periodic intervals. But uh, these rails are mostly based on perlite. 
head, heart, and furlap. And again, you know, cementite is the key feature of these rail steels. So supposing we completely get rid of the cementite and we engineer so that the other properties are maintained, for example, the hardness and the manufacturability on standard equipment that is available for rail making. So we did this uh, more than 25 years ago. Uh, this, this is actually a, a carried out at a test facility in the US where you have heavy traffic going around a sharp curve. So 90 million gross tons of traffic and a typical rail would survive for something over 500 million gross tons of traffic or it should survive for that. And here is what happens on the same track, exactly the same track. This is the carbide-free bainitic rail, which is a mixture of uh, bainitic ferrite, uh, not nanostructured, all right, uh, because the hardness cannot be as high as that. Uh, it's got to be less than something like 400 wickers for many reasons. And you can see that uh, there's almost no damage here. And that's because we don't have hard particles in the material and we have a toughness of something like 50 megapascal root meters, whereas this does not. So toughness is important, uh, both in terms of crack initiation, but also on the characteristics of the surface. Uh, you know, the surface, um, if it falls off, the very microscopic region affected by the wheel. If it falls off, then you also get a high wear rate. So carbide-free bainite has no hard particles, only bainitic ferrite with a structural scale of about a quarter of a micrometer and retained austenite. And what happens is that on that surface, the transformation of that high carbon retained austenite produces a very hard layer which remains attached Okay, remains attached to the underlying steel. So you, are, you have a built-in mechanism of uh, creating a hard layer which effectively reduces uh, damage. Although, you know, you can see that you're, you're actually penetrating deformation to quite a significant depth uh, of, the, of the rail. Um, and that simply shows that the material can flow plastically. Now, this rail uh, was installed in the channel tunnel uh, a long time ago, and this is a picture actually taken inside the channel tunnel. And uh, it's very rare to have lights on in the channel tunnel because it's actually designed to leak water at certain points. And when you go through it, you know, it all appears dark because, presumably because they don't want to see people, uh, uh, they want people to see that some water is leaking into the channel, but it's designed to do that, okay? So you don't need to worry if you see a little bit of water leaking in. So this rail was installed uh, many years ago, and yesterday I got an email, uh, I asked for the information, and I got an email from uh, my colleagues in France and in the UK that this has now exceeded 1 billion gross tons of traffic without developing any fatigue, and throughout its life it has had no grinding. So this, this is the bainitic rail, and this is the corresponding uh, non-carbide-containing uh, carbide rail. So the fact that we've removed these brittle particles has given it an enormous resistance to rolling contact fatigue. Now, of course, um, this doesn't mean that you can replace all rails by carbide-free bainitic rails because the channel tunnel is fairly straight. Okay? When you have uh, sharp curves, there are many other mechanisms which you need to take into account, uh, which cause, you know, you'd be amazed to see how the head of the rail disintegrates after a while. So that is the story about fatigue. And I'll finish off um, by another ancient paper which is from 1843 before the term fatigue actually began to be used. And this was a, a failure which said the surface of the fracture was convex, but in the center, the metal still retained its fibrous fracture. And this is a picture that I took at the Colorado School of Mines uh, in uh, David Matlock's collection 
of spectacular fatigue failures. David is a real expert on fatigue mechanisms. But you know, my point is to emphasize that these very old papers actually contain a large fraction of what we know about fatigue today or about hydrogen embrittlement. It's really worth looking at the extremely old papers because they contain information which we are simply repeating in many of the publications today. So I will stop now and I'll be happy to address questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Harry. That was very interesting. And I would like to give a little bit of applause, but that is only from me, of course, but I'm sure the other 90 listeners would uh, also do that. Uh, so, are there any questions or comments? I see one here. Yes. Yes. I don't know who it is because it's from DS3549. Yeah, it's me. I'm ah, the uh, from Sandvik, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. What is the mechanism of carbide dissolution by deformation was the question. Okay, that's a very good question. The, the simplest uh, uh, and uh, the most common answer is that when you cut a particle, when you break it into two, the surface to volume ratio increases, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, so if you cut it fine enough, it becomes smaller than the critical nucleus size, and therefore it's favorable for it to dissolve. The second uh, scenario is where dislocations, you introduce so many dislocations, and it is well known that a carbon atom prefers to sit at a dislocation rather than in cementite. So if you introduce lots and lots of dislocations, you will not actually get cementite precipitation, but you get some other transient carbide like epsilon carbide forming. And uh, it is, uh, I think it was Cohen uh, and one of his uh, students who produced a map on the dislocation density versus uh, cementite precipitation. So carbon atoms actually prefer to be at dislocation cores than in cementite, energetically. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Yes, maybe I have, can I speak or instead of, yeah, yeah right. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, yeah, when you talk about uh, the, the uh, uh, correlation between yeah, uh, the hardness and uh, fatigue strengths. Mm -hmm. So gener generally, yeah, as you, you said, uh, yeah, increase the hardness of material will increase the fatigue strengths. Mm -hmm. But what, what is uh, about the, 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 the law of ductility? Because the earlier said is a theory. Yeah, if for uh, a, the hardness yeah, reach one certain level, then with the increase the further hardness, then yeah, as a, as fatigue strength will decrease. So how important for uh, ductility of material for fatigue? Yeah, yeah, good question. So um, the Waller test, uh, which is a rotating bending test, mm -hmm. and uh, from which you know the idea of uh, fatigue limit, not fatigue stress, but the fatigue limit, that means the limit below which uh, the stress doesn't produce fatigue, is designed for uh, surface initiation. Okay? And uh, that means that you, know, you have dislocations, moving and producing uh, something like intrusions and extrusions at the surface. Mm -hmm. And that becomes more difficult if you make your material harder. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is the basis of that uh, fatigue limit idea. And it, it works very well for smooth objects, okay? Where you are likely to get uh, surface initiation rather than uh, uh, from inside your material uh, and from very simple stresses. Mm 
yeah, like uh, compression, tension, compression, tension, as opposed to rolling contact or um, friction, sliding. Mm -hmm. So in those circumstances, uh, for that plot, the ductility doesn't come into it. Mm. And that's why I was saying you know, that uh, you can explain fatigue crack growth mm. more or less in terms of engineering parameters like uh, strength. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Mm. Yeah. Patrick, you have a question, please. I can unmute you if you want to say it yourself. Yes. So. Yeah, great, thank you. Great Hello, presentation, Patrick. Harry. Hello there. Uh, when, when we look at, for instance, the comparison between M50 and 52100, I think could be interesting. They both have pretty low ductility, mm -hmm. but, but yet the, the M50 seem to perform much better with less, uh, with less white etching and better fatigue endurance. Um, why, why do they create less cracks then? Have we any idea about that? Actually, that's an excellent question. Uh, and we may have discussed this before actually, but I, I'm not sure. Uh, so, you know, the fact that uh, the cementite in 5 to 100 is forced into solution in the region where we get this uh, mechanical mixing, uh, is also a reflection of the stability of the cementite. Now, the particles we have in M50 are alloy carbides. Yes? Yep. You know, they are not, uh, not cementite. And from a thermodynamic point of view, they are much more stable than the cementite, even though their particle size is very similar to the proyotectoid cementite particles. So it becomes more difficult to take those particles into solution and therefore take the carbon that's in those particles into solution and produce a very hard, hard region. Yeah. So there is some work uh, that someone has done on uh, the stability of particles and uh, how much mechanical deformation would be needed to take them into solution. I can't recall offhand, but the work exists somewhere. Does that yeah, help? We, uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, and we also look at, I mean, we try to improve the microstructural stability of the steel and, and hopefully get the, get the benefit out of that. So uh, I think it, it will be interesting uh, to see the result when we, when we come further on that. So thank you very much for your answer. Okay. Uh, any further questions? If, uh, there you go, Peter. You can mute me now as well. Yeah, I can mute you. And Peter, yeah, Peter Gudmundsson from uh, Solid Mechanics. Uh, uh, a few of my colleagues, I have not done the work myself, but we at the department, it has been studied over some many years here, fatigue, rolling cat, uh, contact fatigue of gears. And uh, there they have seen that asperities play a very important role and uh, they have been able to predict the uh, pitting and spalling based on, on asperities of the surface. So it's not a perfect flat surface. You have some defects in form of, of uh, asperities that cause local stress concentrations. Of, and from that uh, it can be predicted pitting and spalling and things like that. Hmm. No, I, th I think that's uh, uh, important, uh, you know, stress concentrations of any sort, um, including microscopic ones, will cause issues. But I haven't worked on gears, but I think that um, the level of lubrication is uh, also not, not as good uh, in terms of hydrodynamic films compared with the smooth bearing operation because you have sliding involved as well as rolling. Am, am I right about that or not? Well, I, I'm, as I said, I'm not an expert myself, but uh, I know that the, there is uh, lubrication there. They, they take it into account, so they, they look at that issue. Hmm. But uh, how good it is, I can't say myself. 
really. Right. And then there was a question from Björn Claesson, and I cannot unmute you for some reason. I. I no, no, I am my now it works. Please. Yes, sorry. I just had a question on the white matter formation and the actual temperature when that takes place locally. And if you can make any correlations to sort of high speed deformations where you have mm. this competition between thermal softening and deformation hardening. Honestly, I have no idea at all about this, but uh, you, you are right. You know, if you have, uh, you know, 20,000 or 40,000 pulses per minute, it actually involves, um, it must be a high strain rate deformation. So whether it's adiabatic or isotherma, I'm not at all certain about that. What is uh, clear though, is that the carbon remains in solution, okay? Um, in other words, um, whereas the martensite that is, um, Let me just uh, pull up a slide, which I didn't go into detail, but um, if, you, if you look at uh, this slide, uh, I hope you can see it. Yes. This region here uh, is known as a dark etching region and there's no white matter there, but it's effectively a mechanically tempered region of the martensite of the bearing. So that is uh, somewhat softer than this region and it, it's the tempering caused by movements of dislocations inside that region. The white region is actually harder than the surrounding matrix. In other words, it has retained its carbon in solution. So there must be some, some sort of an effect, but I, I really don't know how, how we would tackle that issue. Do you have any ideas on that? Um, Not personally, no. Interesting. And right. thank you for explaining that uh, tampering zone as well. Interesting. Okay. Uh, then there was a question from Siva Prasad Palla, if you want to say it yourself. Yeah. Yes. Uh, can you hear me? Hello. Hello, yeah. Hello, Hari. Yeah, it was a very nice presentation. Uh, my question is with respect to the artificial intelligence based life prediction. Mm -hmm. Can, uh, if multiple damage mechanisms are present, like corrosion, fatigue, and corrosion fatigue kind of things, mm -hmm. and it's uh, actual uh, practical situations, can the model is applicable with respect to life prediction of such components? Yeah, so bear in mind uh, that the variables that we have have nothing at all about the environment. Okay. okay. Uh, so, so I would be very surprised if it actually worked um, for for that scenario. That doesn't mean that you could not uh, deal with that. Okay. Oh yeah. But so these are the variables that we use, and it is absolutely nothing about the environment. Yeah. So you can you can have as many variables as you like in this method. Yeah. Uh, you know we've created. Uh, models for rolling mills, which have more than 100, 100 uh, variables to estimate the properties of the steel that comes out at the end. Yeah. Uh, but if you increase the number of variables and you're relying just on published data, then your sample size gets smaller and smaller because most people don't report sufficient information in every paper that they pub publish. Yeah, yeah. So that is a problem. You know, it, it's the data that you would need, which includes environment uh, in a controlled manner, so that you can capture capture the knowledge. Yes. But the corrosion, etc., many many aspects have been uh, handled using this method. There is nothing intelligent about this, actually. I think uh, terms like artificial intelligence and neural even. Mm -hmm. are really quite uh, redundant. This doesn't get anywhere near being an intelligent uh, model. None of the work actually that is uh, called artificial intelligence is anything to worry about. There's no intelligence in there. There is no artificial intelligence, okay? You can boil this down to 
a single equation, a very, very, very long equation, but it's a single equation which you can read. Yeah. So we need to remove the romance around this topic and actually use it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Are there so any I have a question for the Harris lectures. Uh, maybe I believe, uh, maybe I believe that some students from process units and colleagues are in this class. So actually I'm working on the steel making area. So maybe you explain the effect of carbide uh, on the properties, but in view of the non-metallic inclusions, uh, which should be the most uh, important factors for the in in inclusions like uh, size or hardness itself or the number density. Uh, so but those are many common senses, but uh, I'd like to ask your insight for to the message to the steel making guys. Right. So I, I think the steel making guys uh, are very good because they've reduced, for example, the oxygen concentration down to six parts per million, which we can't even do in our laboratory with uh, our very pure materials and so forth. But the two general principles are as follows that if you have particles with weak interfaces, you've already got cracks, okay? Uh, so those particles you must avoid. And if you have particles which are brittle, that means they will crack at a very low amount of plastic strain, that creates an immediate uh, larger crack. So in those circumstances, I think those two general principles, plus an understanding of the toughness of the material, uh, because you know the crack size will develop by fatigue into a critical size. Uh, so you need to know the toughness of the material or control it to a higher level. If you have a higher toughness, you can tolerate a bigger crack and so on. Those general principles apply, I think. Okay, thank you. And then there was a question from Tani Alu if you want to post it yourself. Yeah, I was wondering, I mean, if, uh, because uh, we were talking about that there is this M50 and this 50 to 100 that both have a different type of carbides. But I mean, there is any model in which uh, you can predict this uh, thermodynamic stability during rolling control fatigue, applying, I mean, different pressures. Yeah. So, so uh, just to repeat your question so that I know that I've understood it, uh, you're saying that, um, uh, you know, can we use thermodynamics to design a more stable carbide? Yes, I mean, yeah. you credit because you are talking about that the cementite is uh, not so stable, then you have the resolution of these carbides. Um, then if we can improve this, then we can improve the performance of the, of the material. So um, at one point um, we thought that because this is a, uh, the normal steel 52100 has uh, chromium in it as well, then um, if you design conditions so that the chromium diffuses into the carbide because it wants to, yeah, uh, if you use uh, thermocalc or similar software to calculate the equilibrium composition, you find that the chromium concentration of those carbides is actually less than what it should be. Uh, then you could make it more stable. But, uh, and I've written that down uh, at the end of my review on the subject. However, nobody has uh, done the experiment. And I think the reason is that there are other variables you need to control. So if you change the oxidizing temperature, then the composition of the cementite will change. But you cannot alter that without changing many other, other properties. So there's a lot of constraint on what you can do in reality, but I think the calculation of the stability of the carbides should be straightforward. Thank you so much, um, nice presentation. Uh, sorry for my pronunciation, Tanya. I did not see, see it in the chat. Uh, Bang Chong, please. No, no, Hi, Professor Harris. Yeah, very good. It's my honor to talk to you. Um, I recall during my PhD study many years ago, I read your very former paper, I guess, regarding the inclusion, uh, 
including including fundamental research lead to including those executive favorite formation. So when hearing about the former the, uh, Professor Park's question, uh, I would like to ask, uh, how do you think about this research, like uh, if it's really possible to in apply it or utilize the fine inclusion to induce some mark structure and it can be really useful in industry? Very good question. So uh, the use of inclusions to stimulate finer structures is well established in welding alloys. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, you, um, extremely well established and you can buy, buy things which are used routinely. All right. So, you know, with certain controlled amounts of titanium and so forth, you yeah. can introduce intragranular nucleated plates. Yeah. Uh, but bear in mind that welds themselves are quite dirty uh, in the following sense that yes, you know, yes. typically they'll contain something like 300 parts per million of oxygen. Yes. So by introducing other particles, you don't cause a problem. And the yes. strength levels, you know, the strongest welding material is less than a thousand megapascal strong. Yeah. And typically it's something like 400 megapascals or less. Yeah. Yeah. So in those circumstances, you can tolerate uh, adding inclusions deliberately, yes. all right, or, or inducing inclusions deliberately. Yes. Uh, and uh, Nippon Steel, uh, many, many years ago, uh, added uh, TI-203 yeah. to a structural steel, ensured again that, you know, you will introduce intragranular nucleation in the heat effective zone of wells, and therefore you get much improved properties. But it is, um, it is different in the following sense that your steels are quite clean yeah. and the structural requirements are really quite um, onerous for a ship, uh, yeah. shipbuilding and so on. So adding inclusions is, unless you have the technology to make completely uniform distribution with avoiding extra particles on the large end of the distribution and so on, yeah. It could actually lead to a detrimental scenario rather than a beneficial scenario. Yeah. So they are not actually popular, the yeah. structural steels with uh, deliberately added particles. Yeah. Okay, I see. Hmm. So are there any final questions? Please just ask them. No, not what I see. Well, now it came one. Uh, and please, Ananta. Uh, good afternoon, Professor. Uh, Hello. My name is my name is Krishnan, and I have a question, like which is more of uh, general in nature. Uh, which method do you propose, uh, especially for steels with lot of secondary uh, phases like uh, carbide particles or let's say cementite particles? Uh, uh, alloy carbides, I mean, uh, whether it's a stress-based approach is suitable or a strain-based approach for, for, for understanding the fatigue behavior is my question. Mm -hmm. I know that there is work going on in SKF, but I don't actually have a good understanding of strain-based uh, design. Um, I don't know, can anybody else help on that? Maybe it's something that you have inspired me to think about, okay? Thank you. <laughs> okay. The answer can come at another point. Okay. Uh, Pasha, please. Uh, let me unmute. Uh, thank you for the excellent lecture. And uh, I'm curious about you saying uh, that uh, hydrogen effects are known for centuries or at least for one century. Mm -hmm. And of course, yeah, I agree. And uh, I also know uh, about some cases when they had to be rediscovered. And uh, uh, yeah, but apart from that, do you believe that uh, our knowledge is basically complete or there are any serious gaps where you would like to know more? 
Yeah, so, so my point about uh, hydrogen was basically that, you know, the experiments that we do, uh, first of all, they are very artificial. You pump in quantities of hydrogen, which are completely unrealistic compared with uh, service conditions. And secondly, we know exactly what result you're going to get, that you will get worse properties. What I think needs a focus on is the prevention of hydrogen improvement, not the mechanisms, because none of the mechanisms actually, um, there's one exception, but none of the mechanisms actually lead to a prediction of hydrogen improvement then you wouldn't need to do any experiments. All the mechanisms are basically qualitative explanations. What you can do from understanding of mechanisms is uh, to design things which will resist hydrogen improvement. And one very, very good example which has worked very well is introducing traps inside your steel. So uh, because it's diffusible hydrogen that causes the damage, if you introduce traps, then the hydrogen cannot move, even if it gets in the steel, and then it is uh, not harmful. So you can actually buy steels that contain hydrogen traps, and it's very effective in, uh, it has been proven in service that the method is effective in preventing, for example, static, unpredictable fracture due to hydrogen in ingress. Uh, that's just one example of uh, preventing hydrogen improvement. There's uh, another one where um, Steve uh, Uwe has done uh, work along with uh, his colleagues uh, in SKF and Owaka, where you put a surface film uh, it's known as uh, black oxide, which amazingly prevents the ingress of hydrogen improvement into, uh, into the steel. And when I say amazingly, I don't understand it fully because it's, uh, it's an oxide, effectively an oxide film, but it seems to work. So I think the biggest progress probably, uh, you know, you can never say for sure, is in using or discovering methods of either stopping the ingress of hydrogen into the steel or when it gets in to stop it from moving about thanks a lot for your answer okay so uh, i do not see any further questions You'll have to move quickly before somebody finds a question. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, thank you so much. And I uh, would like to, I think one should try to keep uh, business as usual in these Corona times. So I suggest, I will unmute all so that we can give an applause since that is what we uh, do, but it didn't work. Unmute all. Ah. Okay. Not Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank, Bye -bye. You. Thank, Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.